the, the toilets are down there. I'm sure you've already found them, and the exit is over there. My name is James Pertel, and I'm from Cox Pertel. My team and I are delighted to be partnered with Didier and Culture Amp for tonight's event. As recruiters, we understand profoundly the importance of culture. Beyond skills and experience, culture is probably the, uh, the, the thing that recruiters of all shapes and sizes need to get more right than they do get wrong, uh, but it's hard to measure. You know, skills can be taught, but culture can't be. It's much harder to, to bring people along that journey. So not only that, uh, getting it wrong can, have, as we all know, have devastating effects on teams. There are so many variables when it comes to culture too and to building a strong culture and it's why despite all sorts of new matching and measuring uh, technologies, we're still a fair way off removing the human interaction from the recruitment process. Uh, importantly, I think a strong culture can be a driver of discretionary effort um, from, from your people and uh, you know, that's a critical, critical thing to get right. Uh, of course, culture is not just an internal concept either. Customers want to know that they are supporting a company that has the, shares the same ideals and values. Prospective employees can and will check out your website, LinkedIn, and all the other social media platforms to gauge your employee engagement. Uh, and I believe that companies that push their cultures online through content ma uh, marketing help humanise their brands and create a sense of unity between the customer, the company, and, and often creating fan, big fans of, of the company. And as well as that, your employees can be your best brand ambassadors. Tony Shea from Zappos says, your culture is your brand. Cox Patel is now in our 22nd year uh, of operation. And whilst I haven't been around for all of that time, uh, my mother founded the business on being good to people, treating people right. Um, and having the highest level of service expectations. So as a boutique recruitment agency and a family business of sorts, our culture is everything. And just like a family, it's everyone's responsibility, I believe, to protect and enhance it. As a recruiter, we are in the ultimate service industry, I believe, uh, and happy people deliver better service. Culture Amp is at the, fo uh, the forefront of the people and culture analytics revolution or, or revelation that is helping many organisations around the world understand what steps they can take to improve theirs, increase engagement, increase ENPS and drive profitability. But of course you didn't come here to listen to me so let me introduce you to Didier Elzinger or DIDS. Didier <laughs> uh, is the CEO and founder of Culture Amp, building software to help organisations craft better workplaces. He was previously the CEO of Rising Sun Pictures, one of the world's leading Hollywood visual effects companies, and founder of Rising Sun Research, winner of a Technical Academy Award. He is a non-executive director at Tourism Australia, Slingsby Theatre Company, the Atlassian Foundation, and the Alfred Research Foundation. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of other achievements I haven't mentioned, but please welcome Didier. Thank you, James. Um, make sure my mic's working. Um, there aren't that many people in the room that can call me Dids, so he's, uh, <laughs> I can blame Kim for that one. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. This is probably one of the f rare days where I can say the weather was actually better in Melbourne. It's warmer in Melbourne when I left than it was when I got here, and that doesn't happen very often. And so what I want to talk to you tonight about is culture by design, and specifically a certain type of culture, a culture-first organisation, what that gives rise to. Um, who am I? Uh, James gave uh, you know, a little bit of an introduction to, to where, where I've come from. I'm the CEO and founder of Culture Amp, and you know, we consider ourselves, you know, our goal is to build the world's leading platform, analytics platform, for understanding people and culture. And that's a goal that I set myself about five years ago uh, when I left Rising Sun Pictures. So in a previous earlier life, I was the CEO of Rising Sun Pictures. We were a computer-generated visual effects company. We worked on Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. And it's took me, taken me a long time to realise, but a lot of what I do now actually draws upon my experience there. And I'm going to talk a bit about that tonight. Um, actually, before I go further, how many people, has anybody in this room other than the Cox Patel people seen me present on this topic? Cool, I can use all the same jokes. Excellent. <laughs> um, I also, social profits were how I prefer to think about my not-for-profit organisations in the sense that they are just striving for a different goal. They, they measure themselves in different ways. So I'm honoured to be on a, a, a part of the Atlassian Foundation with Mike and Scott and they do some amazing work through there and also the Alfred Research Foundation in Melbourne, which is one of our larger hospitals. 
And in earlier lives as well, I used to work in the, in the theatre world as a board member of both Slingsby and Brink. And once again, they're things that taught me a lot. Actually, if I jump back here, I'll just read this out. It's a little bit hard to read because it's quite low res. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Does anybody know what that's from? The picture's a giveaway if you know it. Other than those that were there last time. <laughs> anybody? Little Prince. And I use it because, and this is one of the things that I learnt in the theatre, is so much of the power comes from the poetry. So much of it comes from being able to take a story, or take data, take anything, and turn it into something that speaks to people's hearts. And so that's a little bit of what I want to talk to you about tonight. But before I get started, I need you to do something with me. So we're going to do a little exercise. And if you take nothing else away from tonight, this is something you can take and use. And I've borrowed it, stolen it shamelessly from a person that we work with out of New York, Dr. Leanne Renninger, who presented with us at a, a thing we ran in San Francisco on culture by design. And this is an exercise she uses every day. So I'm going to come back after we've done it and explain to you what it is and why it works and how we use it. But what I need you to do is pair up, so the people next to you, take that pen and the paper out of your things, and we're going to do a little exercise. You can do it with... <laughs> If, if it's not quite even, three people can do it, but two or three people together. And if anybody's watching streaming, they can do this at home. Okay. So what I need you to do, give me one sec. What I need you to do, you have two minutes. What I need you to do is write as many questions as you can about the pen. You're aiming for about 20. You got two minutes. Go. And no stealing other people's questions. Come up with your own. Coming up on one minute. Okay, 30 seconds to go. Trying to get to 20 if you can. <clears throat> I see some people on the second page, that's good. Not everybody. Okay, last 10 seconds. All right, finish the one you're working on. Now, count up how many questions you were able to come up with. How many people in the room had more than 10? Most people. <laughs> how many have more than 15? How many people have more than 20? Johnny Chalmers, well done. This is a man that works in media, right? Now, have a look back at the list, and I want you to think about something. When you're going through that list, somewhere around the sixth or the seventh question, they got hard. Because you've exhausted all the easy ones, all the ones that come first to mind. And because you're here, and you know, I've only just started talking, so you trust me, you kept going. You said, all right, we're going to give this a shot. And so you push through, and you actually force yourself to go to a different part of the mind. 
And what happened is you went into the curious mind. And why is this important? This is important because the curious mind is a wonderful place to be, particularly when you want to learn. And so what I love about this tool, and Leanne used this in the same way at the start of her thing, and she talks about, she does this literally every day. She does it before she walks into meetings. It doesn't have to be a pen, it's 20 questions about anything. And what's so beautiful about it is it's basically a biohack. You just run the exercise and it forces your brain into a different space. However you were feeling before, it allows you to access it because it forces you to push through that easy stuff and into the different mind. And I want you in the curious mind because I'm taking you on a journey and I want you to be open to that. But you can use this in different ways. So how many people in here work in HR? Pretty much everybody, okay. So think about, you're about to walk in to have a very difficult conversation with somebody. You're potentially having to fire that person. You're having to talk to them about their behavior as it traits as somebody else. What mind do you want when you walk in? Do you want a closed mind, which is automatically gonna trigger off their defensiveness? Or do you want an open mind, a curious mind? that's gonna allow you to actually explore this with them and hopefully get a better outcome. So it's a tool that you can use in lots of different ways. So now that you have a curious mind, and, and this, this quote I, I love because it sort of gets to the heart of so much of what I, I like to do in provoking people. Curiosity is the purest form of insubordination. So you need to be willing to take risks, to, to try some different things. But I'm, I wanna to talk to you about culture first. And the first thing I wanna talk about is why culture first? Why do you need to be a culture first company? There's lots of people talking about how important it is. I wanna talk a little bit about why I think it's important. It's important because the way you motivate people at work has changed. But it has not changed because the people have. It's changed because the work has. And I'm gonna go out on a limb. It's not generational. <laughs> We hear a lot of stuff about Gen Y wants this, Gen X wants this, Millennials want this, people are leaving faster than they are before and so on. Some of that stuff is true. But on the whole, if you go talk to a statistician, you talk to somebody about what were the perceptions, how do people feel when they were 20, 30 years ago? Pretty much exactly the same way they feel about being 20 today. It's a cohort effect. You feel a certain way, things happen, things change in your life and you change again. And it actually, by, by talking about it in a generational sense, by saying Millennials need this or Gen Y needs this or Gen X wants that, we're actually masking a bigger issue. We're masking the fact that what we are ascribing to their needs, what we're saying Gen Y and Gen X need, is actually what is needed by people doing a different and a new type of work. So back in 1938, Henry Ford said, why is it when all I want is a pair of hands, I get a brain attached? <laughs> and unfortunately, so much of how we're forced to think about work is built on that idea. How do we motivate the hands? How do we get the hands to move faster? How do we manage the process so those hands can do these things quickly? And I would posit to you that in all of your jobs, in all of your work, whether it's blue collar or white collar, there's an increasing amount of cognitive load in the work that you need people to do. It's less about how fast they can move their hands and it's more about how you can use their brain. And that's actually the heart of what's driving this change. You need people to do a different type of work and the way you motivate that is different. So how many people in here have read Dan Pink's Drive? Okay, so once again, take away my, my pen, pen trick, use that, read that book. <laughs> like, he does a brilliant job. None of the stuff is new. It's just him collecting from a bunch of other people's ideas, but he really dives into this idea of motivation and what motivation looks like. And he helps you to understand that the world of motivation in the type of work we're getting people to do today is different than what it was before, because we're asking people to do different sorts of work. So I used to work in Hollywood. Brad Bird was always a, a hero of mine. He was the director of The Iron Giant, and um, Steve Jobs spent four years convincing him to come and work at Pixar, because he wanted this guy, and he did The Incredibles. That was his first film. And this is something he wrote in a McKinsey article, and I'll read it out if not everyone can see it. If you have low morale, for every dollar you spend, you get about 25 cents of value. If you have high morale, for every dollar you spend, you get about $3 of value. People should pay more attention to morale. And I love it because it's so simple and yet it makes so much sense. You put the money in, if the morale's not good, you just don't get as much for it. And in all our own companies, we can calibrate that. How much do you think you get for that every dollar you spend? And it might be different in different departments. But it's real and it's about something that matters. And unfortunately, when we talk about culture, this is what we usually see. So this picture here, I don't think it's from anybody in this room. This is a HR consultancy. 
This was the front page of the HR consultancy. And look, they have all, they've got women and men and different races, and they're all happy and different ages, and they're about to sing Kumbaya. <laughs> and this is what we think of, and this is unfortunately what executives think about when they think about culture. And put your hand up, we're going to play values bingo. Put your hand up if one of these is in your values. Integrity? <laughs> yeah. Customer service? Ooh, not that many. Accountability? Yeah. Teamwork? Yeah, and innovation. Yeah, congratulations, you're like everybody else in the world. <laughs> and this is a problem, because this is what people think about. They say, hey, we're going to go talk about culture. Oh, you mean we're going to go talk about a bunch of values that don't change, and we're going to talk about being all happy together. <laughs> culture is not soft and fluffy. Culture is built for a purpose. Both of these are cats. One of them is designed to be an amazing predator. I don't know what that's designed for. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what Culture First is about. Culture First is about thinking about culture as something that is more meaningful, something that is more powerful, something that is more impactful. What do all these logos mean? These are all customers of ours. We've worked with over, we've worked, surveyed over a million people. Uh, we've actually launched over three and a half thousand surveys. I got that number wrong. And we've worked with over 300 companies. And we've learned a lot from that process, and that's partly what I want to share with you in two ways. Because the first thing is actually not about the data at all. The first thing is you say, okay, we believe that culture first matters. We believe that we need to build a culture that is really powerful and impactful. How do we do that? There are three things that I think are really, really important to building a culture first company, and they're about understanding what the DNA of that culture first company is. So it's that you see a world that others don't, that you can build on a promise and that you know what you'll hurt for. So I'm just going to talk through each of those. What it means to see a world that others don't, you know, when we start talking about strategy, we start talking about motivation, we start trying to create a business that is going to be amazing, we talk about vision, we talk about where we want to go. And at the heart of it, at the heart of the powerful ones, is an idea of a world that doesn't yet exist that we want to make so. So one of the best... Um, mission, vision, whatever you want to call it, statements that I know of, is one that goes like this. Humans should be an interplanetary species. Does anybody know who that's from? SpaceX. That is amazing. <laughs> because it, in just a few words, encapsulates this incredible possibility of a world that doesn't yet exist that could. And that's the heart of it. It's what is that? What is that world that does not exist that you care about? What is that world that you're trying to bring to being? And there's, you know, there are different ways of doing it, different exercises you can use to do it. It's not about saying that I believe that we can be the market leader in the seven markets that we work in. That is not the it. It's we believe that. What is it you believe that other people don't? Often the power in this is that you're willing to say something that other people would laugh at. You know, if most people got up and said humans should be an interplanetary species, we think they're an idiot. Elon Musk gets up and says it, and we're like, he might actually do it. That's what you want. You want something that is actually so big, it's almost scary. The second part is, once you've described that world, is to understand how that relates both to brand and culture. And so something I like to say is, brand is a promise to a customer, and culture is how you deliver on it. And the thing that drives me absolutely nuts is when we go and have a conversation about brand over here with a bunch of people, and we talk about the brand values and brand promises and all this sort of stuff, and then we go have a different conversation over here with a different group of people about the culture that's meant to deliver on that thing. The two have to be inextricably linked. And it's because they feed off each other. If you do not have a good brand promise, if you do not have something that is going to work, you won't make any money. If you don't have any money, you can't deliver on half the stuff you want to deliver on in here. You know, why can Google do 20% time? Because they make so much money off those ads that they can afford to. You have to have something that actually is going to work. But once you've got that idea, how are you going to deliver on it? You're not going to deliver on it if you're not willing to invest in a culture that's actually built to make that happen. And the two would go hand in hand. So it's this idea that once you know what you're trying to do, be really clear about who you're trying to be out in the market. Be really clear about what that looks like and think about a culture that sits inside it. And at the heart of a culture are values, the things we care about. But values should not be the things that we want to be on a good day. Values are not aspirational. Well, I don't believe they should be aspirational. 
This is a, one of my favourite slides, and it says it's corruption of the Shakespeare. Bleed with me and you'll forever be my brother. That is the heart of good values. It's this is what we're willing to hurt for every day. Now, hopefully it's not physical pain. It's I don't get enough sleep. I don't get to spend enough time with my family. I'm earning less money than I could somewhere else. I drive two hours to work every day. Why? Because there's something that you care about, that other people care about too, that you're willing to hurt for. Understanding that and being able to uncover that and being able to talk about that is the heart of real values. Integrity could be a value, if that's what it means. Normally, integrity means doing what you say you're going to do every time. I don't know about you, there aren't many companies where that's actually possible. It's really difficult. So if you're really willing to commit to that, if you're really willing to make that a thing that you will fire people for, that you will hurt for, sure, do it. Otherwise, you have to find something else, something that does hold true to you, something that you can use and build upon. So the DNA of a culture-first company is exactly that. It's a DNA. It's allowing yourself to go through a process where you sit down and you think about these things and you think about them intentionally. So you sit down and say, what is that world that we want to bring to bear that does not exist now? That will create the energy. That will give me a reason to do this at all. It's about building it on a promise that makes sense to you, but also to your customers and that you've articulated and that you've talked about internally and that you're doing in conjunction with the culture you want to build. Um, so I was having a conversation earlier with somebody in here and, then, and having this, I was having this conversation internally with a very large company about this very, very point. And it's, you can't go and create a brand. The best brand in the world won't work if you can't change your culture to match it. And equally, that culture has to be aligned to whatever you're going to go put out there. So thinking those things through and having those conversations together. Even just putting marketing and HR together. You know, there are companies which actually have people and brand as a single function. That's actually not a dumb idea. And knowing what you'll hurt for. Having that conversation, because the thing to remember as well is it's what you share that you're willing to hurt for. Not just something that somebody said was a good idea. You know, every person that joins your company has to believe those things. It has to be something that they sign their hand up and say, yes, I'm actually willing to hurt for those things because that's why I'm here, because I care. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our stuff, not because it's perfect, it's not, but just to give you an understanding of what does this look like, what does this talk, how, how does, what does this mean? So, you know, for us, the world that we want to make happen, which I kind of oscillate on, it sounds really motherhood and pithy to say in one level, but on the other hand, it's actually entirely true, is that we want to make the world a better place to work. Why? I work with these other foundations and so on that are doing amazing work and helping incredible people. Uh, I look at how much time we spend at work, all of us, and how much of our life work is, and I think if I can make a small difference to the working life of a large number of people, I'll make a net positive gain in the world. So for me, that's my thing. I want to do that. I want to find a way to do it. So the mission for Culture Amp is to make the world a better place to work. And in terms of how we want to make that happen, our actual specific goals are two. The first one is that we want to help 10,000 plus organisations use culture analytics to make better decisions about people and culture and to become culture first companies through doing that. And we also want to be a culture first company. So it's about understanding that it's not just enough to go build a platform, we actually have to go build a company that lives these things as well. And the promise for us in terms of how we think about it for our clients is we want you to learn how to build a better culture. So the promise that we have to make is we have to take you on a journey and we have to help you learn. If you use us and go away and you haven't learned anything, we've failed. You haven't failed, we've failed. And that's the core of our brand promise. And internally we talk a lot about learning and its importance because it's got to be embedded in everything we do for it to be meaningful and authentic. And the four values that, under, that sit underneath that for us are these four, and I'll walk through them to explain how they link together. And the thing about the values is that they're not perfect either. They may change, and I encourage, I, I do inductions with everybody that joins the company, and we talk through all this stuff, and one of the things I say to them is, you know, talk about what works. If something doesn't work, maybe it's time for it to change. We need to have, this needs to be a living thing, it's not just something that's set in stone for all time. The first one is create better people geeks. So you can see my t-shirt here. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about people geeks in a second. It comes from, there's a, there's a woman by the name of um, Kathy Sierra, who's a user experience writer. And she wrote a wonderful article where she said, don't just try and create a better tool, create a better user. And so we take that idea and what we say is it's not just about building a better survey platform or analytics platform, 
It's about creating a people geek. A people geek is the person that sits at the end and actually has to use that data to do something. And so we have to measure ourselves on that. And so for us, this encapsulates a lot of things for us as a company. Internally, you have to be a people geek to come and work with us. It doesn't matter if you're accounts or sales or anything, you have to care about that stuff. Externally, it's about creating a community of people geeks whether you use our tool or not. I mean, a lot of what it's about tonight is for me to, I want to get up in here and tell you our story and hopefully that will entertain you, but also for you to meet other people. And if 90% of you never use our tool, I don't mind, as long as you're becoming people geeks. That's our goal. We want to create as many people geeks as we can. The second one, have the courage to be vulnerable, comes from an understanding of what it takes to actually do anything meaningful with this. So if you're doing individual development or you're doing, you know, at the company level, to do anything worthwhile, you have to open yourself to, up to get hurt. And then you have to learn from that experience and move forward. And that's the reason it's so hard for most people. Anyone that's done a proper 360 knows how hard that can be. Um, anyone who's actually done a proper survey of a company knows how hard that can be too. Um, you know, it's hard for us too. We use our own stuff internally and we, get, we hear things, we're like, I didn't realise that was an issue. I didn't realise that came out of nowhere. Where did that come from? So you have to open yourself up to it. So for us, having the courage to be vulnerable acts in two ways. One, it's to recognise that we have to remind ourselves we're asking people to do things that are really hard. We're asking people to open themselves up in a certain way. And so internally, we have to do that too. We have to be good at doing that, have to be willing to do it. And the next two actually go hand in hand. So trust people to make decisions actually came from my time at Rising Sun. So we were a very open company. Uh, we tried to share everything we were doing. We tried to work together as much as we could. And one of the things I noticed was that there was a little bit of somebody would try and get something really good done and then two weeks later somebody else would come along and say, well, I didn't know about that. Nobody asked me. Maybe we should go back. And we couldn't move forward because you needed everybody's involvement to get anything done. And so I've focused on this. I can see people laughing. I'm not sure if that's because that exists in their world or if it's... Um, how, how do you deal with that? And so one of the things I came to realise was that in any company that's growing fast, any company that's trying to do stuff, nobody can know everything. You know, democracy is a wonderful thing if everybody has enough time to be fully committed to the idea to learn everything and to make a good decision. When you're growing fast, you don't always have that luxury. So you actually have to change the question around. You don't have to say, what is the right decision? The question is, who is the right person to make that decision? And so I'll give you an example of it being working, and this was me screwing up in our own company. We were on the floor working, and so I heard somebody talking about the fact that they wanted to change monitors or buy a new monitor. There was a conversation about monitors. And my ears pricked up because in my previous life, I spent 10 years writing software to colour manage monitors. So I actually know more about the colorimetry of monitors than I'd ever care to admit. So I walked over and said, hey, you know, what are you thinking about? Blah, blah, blah. Here's the different issues and so on. We talked for about 15 minutes, and then I went away. And then the next day, I was doing an induction process with one of our new starters, and I was reading through all this stuff, and I talked about trusting people to make decisions, and I was like, oh, shit. I just broke that myself. You know, the first thing I should have done when I walked over there was not go, hey, here's all this information that's really useful, was be to sit down and say, actually, who is the right person to make this decision? It's not obvious. We don't have a head of IT. There's no one person that really should own this. So who should own this? And then, OK, if you're owning it, I know a lot about this. If you want it, I'm happy to give it to you. You make that decision. And so building a culture where people buy into that is really important to enable you to go fast and it's important for us. And it actually sticks with the next one, which is learn faster through feedback. So why did we build a survey tool? Because we believe in feedback. We believe in the power of feedback and I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a second. So we believe fundamentally that the way you move forward is by trying things and iterating. And the reason trusting people to make decisions is so important is that more often than not you'll get the decision wrong. And so what matters is that somebody said, I'm owning this and I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to improve it and I'm going to do it better next time. So if you believe in feed faster through feedback, then it's much easier to trust people to make decisions because you're actually talking about something different. You're not trying to force people to do it right up front. You're hoping people will own and move this forward. So these are our values. And one of the things that we're working on now is how do we take those values and bring them to life? How do we make that real? Because that is just words on a page. It might be different words on a page to somebody else, but it's just words on a page. And so you need to find stories that tell this. And this goes back to my Hollywood days, and I've only now really started to understand the power of this. So the story I told you just then about how I breached that value is a much more powerful teaching aid for every person that joins our company than any amount of text I can have up here, because it's a real story. The fact that it was the CEO that screwed it up is even better, because that gives permission for other people to understand what that means. So a lot of this is about 
getting the idea but then going and searching for the story and the poetry and the way to make that work. And this process here, I'm, just going, I'm going to read this out to you in a second. We just went through a process where we, uh, I would say we did a rebrand, but we didn't really have a brand before, so it's not really a rebrand. Um, we're finally big enough to have enough time to do it right, so we said, okay, to one of our designers, you've got a month, do it from start to end. And she went through the whole process. And where we got to at the end was, this is our new brand mark, called Frank, not sure why. Um, and it's based on the concept of an ENSO. And I'll just read something out to you, and then I'll explain something about it. So, our brand mark takes cues from the circular brushstroke of the ENSO, in form and intention. The Culture Amp platform captures moments in time in a person's journey, both professionally and personally. Over time, these snapshots tell a story. The process of asking and answering questions becomes a ritual or practice from which emerge opportunities for challenge and growth, or change and growth. When she showed this to me, it was late in the process and she was writing it to describe where it had come from. I almost cried because it is the best description of what we want to do that I'd ever read. I didn't tell her to write this. This was one of our designers just working through what we wanted to be, talking to people and trying to unearth a way of expressing it. But in this, she managed to tell poetically and beautifully what we want to do. We're a technology company, but behind that is an idea. And she managed to capture that idea and to tell it back to us. And that was a wonderfully powerful thing to do. So you have to open yourself up to that process. The second part of how this manifests for us is the people geek idea. And it actually came out of a somewhat chance thing. We were doing our first batch of t-shirts. And we are like, what should we have on the label? We couldn't come up with anything. And we tried all these different ideas. And then somebody walked past with a t-shirt for another company. I can't remember which company it was. I think it was New Relic. And it said, Data Nerd. And so we took that and we started riffing on it. And then somebody came up with the idea of People Geek. And we kind of looked at it. Oh, that's a bit silly. But it sort of sat in the corner. And we kept coming back to it. And we were like, actually, that is it. That's who we do all this for. That's who we are. That's who we want to go find in Seth Godin terms. That's our tribe. And for us, a people geek is a mix of the hard and the soft. It's someone who's coming from a people and culture side who's realized that they need more tools. They need more data. They need more ways of being able to express this and show this and use this in an organization. They need to be more iterative, more adaptive. But it's also engineers. It's finance people. It's analytic people saying, at the end of the day, the only lever I've got is people and culture. And it's that combination of the two, it's a people geek. So that's for us as, as good a manifestation of us and the culture that we want to build as anything, is knowing who you are, and we are people geeks. So I am a software, we have a software company, and we talk about data, and this is probably the most overused quote in Silicon Valley. In God we trust, all else bring data. Edward Deming. So how do you bring data to bear? How do you use data if you, if you have an idea of what a, your culture first company should look like and you've thought through what that DNA is, how do you use data to bring that to life? It's actually very simple and it's also very, very hard. So this is the learn, act, repeat loop. You learn, you act, and you repeat. And you do this over and over again. And in the core of it, it's about asking questions. Asking the right questions, using those questions to build a case for change, fixing something, and then going around again. And without talking about technology, without talking about data, that's all you actually have to know. If you can do that, you can do everything else. But I'm going to dig into it in a little bit more detail. So the first thing is, if you start talking about asking questions, collecting data, getting into this iterative process, people start talking about, you know, this works at different levels. So a lot of what we do with clients is working at the organizational level. Engagement surveys, onboard surveys, offboard surveys. But it also at the personal level. So we work manager effectiveness, manager 180. How many people have read Laszlo's Block's book on, from Google? OK, a couple of people. That's a really interesting book, because he basically describes what they went through at Google. At Google, Larry turned up one day and said, we don't need managers. Get rid of a lot of them. So they did. Got rid of all of them. And then six weeks later, they went, that was a really bad idea. But being engineers, it wasn't enough just to bring people back in. They had to sit down and say, well, why do we need managers? And what makes good ones? And, and so on. And so his book is a description of what he did. And depending on how much you read, none of it's that revolutionary, but it's very well put together. And he really brings to bear the idea of this iterative, data-driven approach to go, well, what do we think is right? How do we measure that? How do we use that to improve our process? And these are the sorts of things we like to help people with on the platform. And one of the questions that I get all the time is, OK, I know what I'm trying to do. I, I've, I want to do this stuff. How often should I be 
asking these questions. And there's lots of stuff going around. So there's some people saying, well, you've got to do this big thing. And for everybody that's done, how many people have done a big annual engagement survey that took way too long? Mm -hmm. yeah, most people. OK. So there's that process. And I like to make an analogy between this and finance, which is doing that sort of thing is like a balance sheet. It gives you a really good understanding of the health of your business. But if I came to you and said, you need to run your business, I'll give you a balance sheet on January 1, and I'll give you another one next January, go for your life you'd look at me like I was mad because you can't run your business with just that. You need other tools. You need access to more information. And so there's a lot of talk at the moment about people collecting data faster, collecting more data, and that can be really valuable because it gives you more information. So things like tracking surveys and pulse, pulse surveying, you know, pulse surveying where you're going out saying, let's collect data every month or let's collect data every quarter, is like a p &L. It's helping you understand what's changing in between so that you can see what's going and you can change your course. Like if you do a big thing at the start of the year and you realise collaboration is a problem, do you want to wait a year to find out whether or not you've improved it? You need to know along the way. And even more, if you look at what's coming from sort of marketing and continuous real-time type stuff, is having stuff that's running all of the time. And for me, that's kind of like a cash flow. That's telling you every day. And sometimes people are coming out saying, just do this or just do this. It's the answer. Get rid of annual engagement surveys. You don't need them. That's not entirely true either. Thing is, if you're just running a business off cash flow, it's good, but you won't see some of the things that are going on. You won't see the inventory piling up out the back. <clears throat> you, it's very easy to get lost in the noise. And so what we often talk to people about is what matters is not so much the measurement, uh, so the cadence of measurement, but what matters is the cadence of action. So how can you use this data to do something? That's the cadence you need to start to think about. And then inside that, there are multiple levels that you can use to make it work. So just as an example, you might do something like an annual engagement survey where you collect this information to set a, a thing once a year, and that tells you how you're going, and in between you use the other ones. And getting people to buy into the process, not just of the measurement, but of the action, is really, really important. And what you want to be clear about is what are we measuring? So how many psychs are there in, a room, in the room? Like proper, real psychs, unlike me. <coughs> I have, my dad's a psych and my wife's a PhD candidate, so I'm a psych by proxy. Um, but one of the things I like to say to people is there's an incredible amount of fantastic and useful research on how to ask questions, what questions work, how you use those. And we have a whole bunch of those, and we have psychs on staff um, to provide people with validated questions and validated structures. But at the end of the day, what really good companies do, it's not just a psychologist in an ivory tower telling you what makes people happy. The best people have an intentional description of the experience they want their people to have, and then they measure if that's occurring. I'm going to say it again because it's very simple, but it's also very, very hard. So it's an intentional description of the experience they want their people to have, and then measure if it's occurring. So the heart of this in terms of what questions should we be asking actually requires you to look inwards and say, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to actually create here? Whether it's about talking about what you expect from managers, whether it's about talking about what type of company you're trying to build, it's about being clear on that and learning how to articulate it. Because surveys are actually bi-directional. When you send somebody a survey, A, you're asking them for stuff, but you're also telling them what you think is important. And people don't always think about the fact that every question they ask is a signal about what you think is important. And if you're not going to do anything, if the question's too hard, don't ask. So I love how many times you come to this situation where you run the whole thing and they sit back and go, I'm sure glad that hole's at the other end of the boat. Pay's a classic one, but there are things where if the executives are not going to be able to deal with the result, and so we always talk to people, when you're going to use a question, when you're talking about should we have this question in or out, simple test. What will you do if you get a good score and what will you do if you get a bad score? If the answer is nothing, don't ask the question because you're just going to create pain. Speaking of nothing, one of the most powerful things you can do when you go through this process, so you collect the data, you start to get a picture of what's going on. Before you leap into actually starting to say, we should do this, we should do that, you step back and you say, what happens if we do nothing? And you use the data to explore that space. So if you're running an engagement survey, for example, and you're using a retention question like, you know, I still see myself here in two years' time. You look at the demographic breakdown on it, you can start to see some really interesting stuff. So you can sit down. I was working with a particular client. And we're looking at this. And I said, oh, what's this team over here? 
And I said, oh, that's our product management team. You know, we just bought a company. We're really excited. These people have come on board. That's going to change our whole business. I said, great. Uh, this, their answer to this, only 20% of people agreed with that question. Let's just work out the maths. They're all going to be gone in two years. And they're like, whoa. And they're like, oh, and let's look at this one. Half of them are going to be gone. And let's look at the men versus women. Yeah, they're all gone too. Work that through. If you turn around and say, okay, we have a choice. What the data is telling us is that we can choose to do nothing. And if we choose to do nothing, half this department's going to go. Two thirds of these people are going to go. These people are not going to take risks anymore because they don't see the point. That's the conversation you have to have before you even start talking about what you are going to do. Because until people can see a reason to, there's no, there's no drive there. And so this is a really important part um, when you're going back and actually presenting to executives. It's all cost benefit. It's all trade-offs. So you need them to understand you have a choice. You can do nothing. That's an active choice which will have consequences. Here, now, none of this is perfect, but we can use the data to start to tell a story. We can use the data to take people on a journey to see what this might look like. And then once you've done that, you've said, okay, now I've got your attention because that team, that company you just bought for $20 million is all going to walk out the door. Now I have to have the opposite battle, which is I have to convince you to let me only do one thing because you're going to want me to fix six. And then each department's going to want me to fix another three. And you're going to die. <laughs> it's not possible. Change management is very, very, very difficult. And so really the, the cycle is, OK, I've got your attention. We're going to make a change. Let's fix one thing. And this is where the magic happens. And this is the thing that almost everybody fails at. And I put my hand up and say, I fail at this too. Do it again. Nothing happens until you go round again. So it's not about doing something once and creating this great change program and then launching off and then it all faltering and not falling down. It's like you do this process and you say, great, we've learned something. We're going to go do this. We're going to fix it. And then we're going to measure again. And we're going to find out if it worked. Maybe it didn't work. We're going to do it again and again. OK, now we've done it. And not only have we done it, we've actually created some goodwill now because we actually understand that this is possible, that you can actually achieve something if you go and do it. So sort of in summary, the things that I would like you to take away, the things that I'd like you to think about are, the world of work is changing. So should you. Building a culture first company is not something that's nice to have. It's something that's actually essential if you want to succeed. To do that, you have to understand your DNA. You have to know what you're willing to hurt for. You have to know who you want to be. And then once you have that, you need to go through this process. You need to go through this learn, act, repeat cycle. You need to ask the right questions. And psychologists, consultants, people, Companies like us, we can help you ask the right questions, but only you know what those are. You need to build that case for change, and you need to fix one thing, and then do it again. So on that note, I will bring my presentation to an end. But I'd like to leave you with my favourite quote from George, George Bernard Shaw, which is an anthem to entrepreneurship. People who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those that are doing it. Thank you. <laughs>